Well, the Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So let's preach the cross. Hi folks, my name is Caldwell. I want to get right into what I really want to share with you guys and make sure that this message is as clear and concise as possible and receivable on this playlist about the road to strong delusion. We went through all those things that they say, all the false teachers, all the false doctrines, how it warps your brain. But I want to give you some truth here and I want to give you God's word and I don't want to tell you what I say. I want to tell you what the word of God says so that you can know for sure that you're saved. And if you don't know you're saved, keep watching until the end. Romans 3 is the beginning of what people will call the Romans road to salvation because they read it to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, not Romans chapter 3, Romans 1, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, if you get saved... It's because of two things, the gospel of Jesus Christ and your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see this. The first thing you're going to know about the gospel is there has to be bad news in order for good news because it's not about good news all the time. It's There's bad news to this problem. And the problem is all have sinned, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible tells us that everybody in this world, everybody since Adam and Eve, have all at one point or very, very often, actually all of us very often do, sin against God. What does it mean? Anything that we do, think, or say that goes against God's holy word that he instructed his people that he created in his image to live like, when we went out and did it our own way, it was a sin against God. When the Bible said to go like this and we decided to go any other way, that was a sin against God. We willingly sin and oftentimes we ignorantly sin, but the Bible directly tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That puts us all equal and we all need the same message of the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel is for sinners in 1 Timothy chapter 1. The gospel is not for the righteous man, but for sinners, for the ungodly, for the for men's killers and women killers and those people who, who despise sound doctrine, as it says there. Anything that be contrary to sound doctrine in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I can just read it for you. Now, I want you to know this picture in this chapter gives a black and white picture of the gospel. And this thing... This doctrine of black and white salvation is very much under attack in our society today, especially in those delusional churches where they don't want a black and white picture of I was at one point a Christian killer like we see in this chapter. And now I'm going to write you two thirds of your New Testament, which is Paul, a real person. But he was transformed by this, knowing this, that the law, a.k.a. the Old Testament, first Genesis all the way to, I believe, Deuteronomy, Genesis to Deuteronomy. The law is not made for the righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Now I want you to understand that the law was given, as Galatians 3 says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And it says in Galatians 3.24 that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 3.22 is one of my favorite verses where it says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. That's the same thing Romans was telling us. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before the faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Now, this whole Old Testament system and sacrifice and all those things that do this and don't do this was directly created so that these Old Testament Israelites would know that they were in sin and did not meet the standard of God. They did not meet that standard. That's what, meaning, that's what it means when it says we have fallen short of the glory of God. The next thing I need you to understand after understanding that you are a sinner, you are wicked in the eyes of God in the way you live your life separated from him. But that's that second part I want to tell you is Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. There is a consequence to doing things the opposite direction than what God intended for us to go. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death, and it also tells us in Isaiah 59, starting at verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your iniquities 
have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And I want you to know that the more the Bible says to, you know, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up, the more we decide to puff up ourselves and talk about how good we are, how great of children, how great of dads, how great of moms, how awesome our work is, the more we puff ourselves up, the more we give ourselves pride. That's a sin that is separating us from God. The character of God is humble. The character of God is love. The character of God is truth. When we lie, when we show pride, when we show spite, bitterness, anger, envy, we are separating ourselves not only from God in a spiritual way, but obviously we are separating ourselves from the character of God. Not only that, we separate ourselves from the blessings of God. God intended for us to enjoy the fruits of a virtuous lifestyle. And the more we do everything the Bible tells us not to do, the more we have a lifestyle that is, first of all, not virtuous. We have a bad name instead of the good name, which Proverbs tells us we should have. But the Bible tells us that there are consequences to our actions when we behave immorally that most of the time we can't even fix anymore. There are certain things that this world told you to do that were immoral. And when you do them, you can never undo them. You can never unteach your body to be addicted to, to, to cocaine, to all these things. You can never unteach your body to be impure because of what you did with another indiv individual. We can't undo those things in this modern world, but that's part of the corruption of sin, the consequences to our actions. We cannot, and nor can we save ourselves because we are separated from God. Therefore, it is impossible for us to reach God. And I'll even show you this. This is what God himself said when he was talking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee. Because human beings love the idea of trying to be able to reach heaven without God, reach salvation without the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so John 3.13 says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And that's Jesus Christ. In the same passage it talks about for God to love the world, he's telling us that we don't get up there. God had to come down. For God to love the world that he gave, and God sent his Son, verse 17. Why did he send his Son? Because we were in sin, separated from God, and because we were separated from God, we need a Savior. Not only because we are going to die and be eternally separated from Him, but because on this current world, in this current life, we have an immoral lifestyle, we have a, a spiritual need, a depravity, a life that has only a body and soul and without a spirit, our spirit is dead. And not only that, the consequences of our actions are making our life worse day by day, and we avoid it through delusional things like we talked about in the video. But the Bible says in John chapter 3, if you scroll up here, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye must be born again. Now, what is that born again part? Well, if we were created body, soul, and spirit, but our spirit died when we were separated from God, a.k.a. Adam and Eve did not any longer have the Holy Spirit of God, when we are born again, we receive that spirit again. That spiritual life, that living water, that light that Christ was, was created in man when we were originally made before we fell into sin and each individual person fall in, falls into sin and separates themselves from God. And they do not have the Holy Spirit. Romans 9, 4 says, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you are none of his. Or I believe it's Romans 8, 9. But either way, we need that spiritual life. That lack of the Holy Spirit is why so many people in this world have an empty void. Because God's spirit is eternal. God is eternal. He is an infinite God. And so when we try to fill that void with something besides the scriptural truth, of the gospel, of our sins being paid for, which need to get paid for in order for us to experience this full life, this salvation, this heaven, this eternity with God. We need salvation. We need someone to save us because we cannot save ourselves. You cannot save yourself through going to church for 20 years, for 40 years, for listening to music for that many years, for being a Christian artist, for being a Christian celebrity, for doing all these works to get yourself saved. I want to promise you something. I promise you, you will not save yourself by being the most super hyper religious person on the planet. You can go to any university or Bible college you want to. You will go to hell when you die if you do not trust in Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise might be given unto them that believe in Jesus Christ. That means you're not getting to heaven without faith in the gospel. You will go to hell when you die. I promise you, you will see fire and flames for eternity if you do not choose to put your faith in Jesus Christ. This is a sobering message, but the Bible says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
why on earth would he even mention the perishing part? Because human beings who are separated from God in their sin are already perishing. They're spiritually getting worse. Their minds are getting worse. Their hearts are getting worse. Sometimes they get better through a little bit of remedy, but they really don't fix the issue. And we are suffering. So, so, so how do we get rid of this? If the Bible says for the wages of sin is death, that means we are owed death by our sin. But also understand this. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 right there. So why would it be essential for Jesus Christ to die for our sins? Because there was a payment that needed to be made. And Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. When thou shalt make it atoning for the soul, thou shalt offer the blood. That, that blood that Jesus Christ shed when he walked or he carried his own cross and was hung and nailed to a cross that blood that he shed when they put a crown of thorns on his hair on his head that blood that he shed when they took a cat of nine tails where they had nine metal scrapes nine metal nails and they attached it to leather straps and attached it to a handle and they ripped it into his back as if it was a as if it was a plow in the ground it was ripping up that blood that he shed on that day was because you and i are sinners because, because you chose to do things rather than follow the Lord. Because you chose your alteration of scripture, which is intentional disobedience to God. Because I chose idolatry and to worship these things rather than God. Because I chose to put my family's word above the word of God. That is sin. That is blasphemous. That is idolatrous. And we have done this. We have done this and it has separated us from God. And those you need to make a direct correlation right now. The very, very reason why Jesus Christ was brutally beaten, rejected, despised. His very disciples left him and rejected him and ignored him. And they denied even following him. All of that separation from God, all of that, my father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That Jesus Christ being separated from God, that's what you deserved. That's what I deserved. For the wages of sin is death. We were owed that brutality, that wrath, that destruction, that hatred that Jesus Christ received on the cross. He did not receive any mercy. And when he sniffed mercy, when they were going to give him vinegar mixed with gall to ease the pain, he rejected it. He tasted it and he didn't even drink it because he did not want any mercy on him whatsoever. When he knew it was what it was, he spit it away and he gave up the ghost. It is finished. And that's what John says. It is finished. Why is that? Because your sins were fully paid for. But the gospel was not finished. He died, but then he was buried for three days and he rose again the third day. Why? Because Jesus Christ had to take the blood that was on the cross that was shed for your sins and my sins and take it up to the Heavenly Father. And so therefore, when he, laid his, our, when he laid his blood upon the altar in a high priestly sacrifice, which is what the Old Testament explains, when they would give the sacrifice in Hebrews 9, that offering that they would do would be to please the Father. And it wouldn't please them as far as salvation in the Old Testament, because they were all just a picture of Jesus Christ in the first place, which is what Hebrews teaches. Hebrews is all about explaining the Old Testament and how the Old Testament all points to Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross is what pays for our sins forever. And so, when we put our faith in the fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood for our sins, rose again the third day to give us eternal life, that eternal life was given because he took the payment for our sins and laid it upon the Heavenly Father's altar, or on that throne, on that seat. And therefore, it is a sweet-smelling savor, and God can accept us. God can accept us, not because of our merit, not because of what I do, but because of Jesus Christ. And that's why it says, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, because Christ didn't need your help to do the gospel. He didn't need my help, but we need his help. We need his gospel. Christ died for our sins. He doesn't need us to help us spread the gospel. He needs you to believe the gospel for you to get saved. You need to believe the gospel. Jesus doesn't need you. Jesus doesn't need me. Jesus Christ needs a person who believes the gospel to believe it for their own good, not for his. He does not need us for anything. We are unprofitable servants, but here is the gospel. <clears throat> for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god and i want you to see also in first peter chapter 2 i'm just going to give you some gospel scriptures right here 
For even hereunto were ye called, verse 21, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his footsteps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body, on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. But are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. If you believe Jesus Christ died for your sin. This is awesome. Your soul is going to be in heaven forever. You can die in peace knowing you are going to heaven. That is what I want for everybody. I know not everybody will accept that message. And not everybody even accepts the message that God created this world that Jesus Christ spoke it into existence. They don't accept the fact that he spoke Psalm 33 and it stood fast. They don't accept the fact that the very creator of this world created this world by his own word and gave us those words in the English language. They don't believe that. They don't have enough faith in God to say that God can give his word to people who he wants to believe the gospel. They don't believe that. But I believe that you should because it's about your soul. Right there. You saw it. First Peter 2.25 I want you to know for sure when you look at Jesus Christ, when you're dead one day or when you get raptured, you are not going to be afraid because you weren't so deluded and religiously experiencing foolish things that you didn't consider the fact that your own sins need to get paid for. And this, this verse has been on my mind all day and I'm not going to get a chance to not talk about it because it's been on my heart and my mind all day. The majority of the Christian world is very scared of these verses that are on your screen right now. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. And I talk about them very often. Not as often as I should, probably. But these verses say, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me ye that work iniquity. There's hundreds of reasons why people think that this verse is scary. But the ultimate reason is because they get sent away by God and they don't end up in heaven. But they won't address exactly what's in these verses. They did not know the real Jesus Christ and they did not get their sins paid for. The real Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, died on the cross for your sins. To change you from a sinful creature who loves sin, who lives in sin, who doesn't recognize their sin oftentimes and needs the help of the Holy Spirit to acknowledge their sin, to change you from that person to a sanctified person. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God, which bringeth salvation, hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodly and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You will know you're going to heaven by the way your lifestyle has changed in this present world, in this time, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. I want you to know that the Bible is intended to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. This is, this is an important message for your life, sir, ma'am. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, the Bible, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You need the Bible, you need the gospel, and I need you to believe what you're reading and seeing. That's what I want for you, because it will change your life. It will take you from dreadful to joyous, and you won't need anybody to help you experience God or usher the presence of God in ever again. You won't need anybody to tell you this, that, or the third from God, because you already have the whole word of God right here. And you won't need it. The sufficiency of scripture is talked about in the very next verses right here. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That's talking about the sufficiency of scripture. You won't need anything else for you to know how to live righteous in this world but a Bible and to guide it, guard it in your heart. And then we talked about this. They're going to at some point take away these Bibles, but I want you to believe the message of the gospel, how that Christ died for your sins and my sins. And he did it because he loved you. 
I'm just giving you more gospel messages because it needs to get strong in here about the gospel. But God commendeth his love toward us. Romans 5, 8 is right there. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did it for us, not for himself. Much more than being now justified by his blood, the life of the flesh is in the blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if... When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He rose again. We're going to be sa we're saved because we believe that he's not, he's not condemned to sin forever. No, he took our sins to, with him to the grave and he arose without him, victorious over them, conquering death, conquering sin forever. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. I, I want to give you this right here. Colossians 3. This is a passage I use often as well. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's where he is right now. Jesus Christ isn't in every single song that we sing today saying he's going to come and usher his presence in and then just be there with us. No, that's not literally the presence of Christ. It's the acknowledgement of him in our mind and our heart. He's at the right hand of God according to the scriptures. Set your affection on things above not on things on the earth. That includes music. That includes Christian celebrities. That includes Christian content and TV and whatnot. Our affections shouldn't be on getting so comfortable in this modern world. And many Christians lose that. They, they lose that focus that should be on things above. Making sure sh souls get saved by the Bible and not just by repeating a prayer. This video was not about you repeating a prayer, by the way. This video was about you at some point today or tomorrow or when you heard this message. You got on your knees and you acknowledged the fact that God was manifest in the flesh. That's what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy. This is you acknowledging the great mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. That was the gospel. We just preached the gospel to you believed on in the world, received up into glory. And don't worry, one day we are going to be received up into glory as well, where we will no longer have this ache and pain of our current bodies. I won't have aches and seizures. I won't have my back pains. I won't have to crackle every five seconds. And neither will you because we get new glorified bodies that can no longer be corrupted by sin anymore. We don't have to look at our arm and remember that abuse we gave ourselves or that our abuser gave to us. We don't have to look at our leg anymore and remember that person's grip on our leg that caused a bruise to remain there our whole life. These are things that God promises to redeem in the heaven that is to come. But the first important thing is that we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior over our individual sins that we did against Him. That's what we need to prioritize. We sinned against God, separated ourselves from God because we attacked. We added to the beatings of Jesus Christ in our own sin. We separated ourselves from the Heavenly Father who we cannot reach in our prayers until we do acknowledge our sin and acknowledge our Savior. And we separated ourselves from the Spirit of God because we do not have the Spirit of God until we get saved because we were created with the Spirit of God but died when we committed sin. Spiritually, we died. And so therefore, we need to receive the gospel which can move the sins off of our record. And if the sins are off of our record, then Christ can finally dwell within us. Which is why you can't just receive scripture and just get saved. You need to receive the gospel. Because the gospel is the message that pays for your sins. It's the, it's the atoning blood. And so therefore, when those sins are off of your record, then you can receive the Holy Spirit of God through faith in the gospel. And you can be reconciled back to your Heavenly Father. And you can know and have a personal walk with Jesus Christ by following what you see inside the red lettering in this Bible. Or just the whole Bible, obviously. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so therefore, this message was made to ensure that you hold fast to what this teaches and hold fast to the gospel message. For by grace are ye saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is an unmerited gift. That means that God's gift of salvation, that saving, that's the gift. And it's by your faith in that message, choosing to believe it, that will get you saved, not by your works, not by your religiosity, not because God chose you and didn't choose others or vice versa. 
Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And I want you to know that God originally intended for mankind to walk pure and upright. But he's just asking his Christians, his believers, those who have trusted in the gospel, to do the same thing that he would have asked Adam and Eve to do before the fall of man. The good works that he before ordained that we should walk in them. That's why he tells us to love one another, remove all bitterness and envying and malice. That's why he tells husbands to love your wives and wives to submit to your husbands. That's why he tells them, uh, not forsaking the assembling of the saints together as the manner of some is, and the much more as you see the day approaching. That's why he tells us to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why he tells us in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's why he tells us those things, because he originally wanted us to enjoy a spiritual life with a morality that is constantly growing as we morally grow, or I should say as we biblically grow in the knowledge of him. And that's nothing to be prideful about. That's just something that teaches you more humility. So I hope this video was a helpful message to be direct and as direct as possible with the message of the gospel. And I hope it was a blessing to you. What does the Bible Get teach reading. about the presence of the Lord? John 15, 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Keeping the commandments keeps us in the presence of the Lord. Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. When we sin against the commandment of God, we hide from the presence of God. Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Our sin and our sinful state separates us from the Lord God and his love and his peace. 1 Corinthians 1, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. There is no reason for mankind should be exalted above one another, because none of us can reach God. Isaiah 57 and 15 for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Where there is humility before God, his presence is there. First John 3, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us, by the Spirit which he hath given us. God will be present with us when we trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus ye who were sometimes afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. It is God's work, not our own that we can now reach him, because he first reached us. Philippians 4, 9, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Continuing in the knowledge, faith, patience, obedience, and love of Christ will keep his presence close to you always.